Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What do you know about the temple? I mean, if you've spent any time in church or in Sunday school or digging through the scriptures, you surely know that the temple was very important, especially to the people of God who lived in the Old Testament and even up into Jesus' day, of course. But what do you actually remember about the temple and its history? Of course, there has not always been a temple. God did not build a temple there in the Garden of Eden. No, there he simply walked through the garden right next to Adam and Eve before sin came into the world. Then after that, after sin had come into the world, of course God located himself in various places in order to meet with his people, the burning bush, to take one. But it was at the time of Moses, later in his life, that a specific sanctuary was finally constructed in order that God would meet with his people. It's what the Bible called the tabernacle, and it was a sacred tent, essentially, which was set apart for God and his people to meet. The Bible tells us about this tabernacle that there came a day when the cloud of presence, we are told, hovered over that tent and the glory of the Lord filled that space. The people knew that God was there. Years later, after God's people had left behind the wilderness and had conquered the promised land, King David, we are told, thought it rather odd that he was living in a nice house, a nice palace, and yet God himself was still being worshipped in a tent. And so he offered to build God a house. And yet God said he did not wish for David to build him a house. Instead, he would have David's son, Solomon, do so instead. And so Solomon built the temple He built the temple, and then he moved into that temple, the Ark of the Covenant, which had always been the symbol of God's presence. And again, on the day when that happened, we are told again, this cloud came over the temple, and that the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Again, the people knew that God was there. And that temple would stand for many, many years, but not forever. No, that temple would finally be destroyed when the Babylonians came to exile the people out of the promised land, to take them out of the land and to destroy that temple. For about 70 years after that, there was no temple at all. And then finally, and strangely, with the help of two pagan princes, a new temple was begun and then was later completed. The people rejoiced to have a temple again, and yet they recognized that it was never quite the temple that was first built. It's interesting as you read through those stories to note this, that while we have for both the tabernacle and the temple, that account of the cloud of presence coming and the glory of the Lord filling the temple, we never have such a story with this second temple. No, we don't get this moment where it was obvious that God had come to dwell there in that temple. Even after Herod the Great, who ruled leading up in the days of of Jesus, made significant improvements to the temple, it was still known by all that there was still something sort of missing. And yet, the temple was the center of the people's life with God. All devout Jews gathered there in the temple It was the place where God had promised to deal with and to dwell with his people. In the Old Testament, the prophets of old, including Haggai and Zechariah, they spoke about a day coming when God would indeed make that second temple great. In fact, in the way they spoke, they acted like the glory of that temple would somehow exceed the glory that was in the tabernacle or the first temple. But how would that happen? Well, they spoke of a day when the Lord would come into his temple in a new way. And that's where we come to in our reading for today. There we meet a man named Simeon. And we're told that this man named Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. 
What does that mean? Well, it means that he was waiting for an event that would bring comfort to all of God's people. He was waiting for an event that would bring to fulfillment all the promises of God. We're told that specifically he was waiting to see the Lord's Christ because the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would get to do so before he died. Yes, on the day of our text, all of his hopes were turned into reality. The promises that God had made to him were proven faithful. Mary, 40 days after she had given birth to Jesus, brought him into the temple. Mary was simply doing as the Old Testament law required. You see, ever since the firstborn sons of Israel had been spared from the final plague during the days they were in Egypt, God's people were to bring their firstborn males into the temple to present them to the Lord. Moms were also to appear there to be purified ritually after giving birth. So Joseph and Mary were there just to do what the law required. They brought Jesus into the temple, likely for the very first time. Simeon, because of God's revelation to him, though, understood that Jesus' coming into that temple had much greater purpose than perhaps even Joseph and Mary understood. He knew that Jesus was there in the temple ultimately to deliver the salvation that the Father had prepared for all people. He knew that he was there in order to be a light that could shine before all the Gentiles. He was there as the glory of the people of Israel. He knew that Jesus was there to be the comfort and consolation of his people. You see, when Jesus appears in the temple, finally that second temple was filled with the glory spoken of by the prophets of old. The glory of Israel was now in his temple. Now this time, God did not descend in a cloud of presence, but instead walked in the same door as everyone else in human flesh. Or I should say was carried, likely, in the front door, like any infant would have been. Indeed, God in that moment came in a way that he had not been in the temple before. He came and filled it with glory. The light of the Lord's Christ shone inside of the temple as long as Jesus was there. And in that moment, then, this second temple was brought to the fullness of its glory. All the prophecies about it were fulfilled. And yet, in one way, it also began to fall apart that day. The temple, that is, the building itself. For indeed, from this point forward, people would not need to seek out God in a building in particular, but instead they would find God wherever Jesus was. The building itself, that temple, would begin to crumble in importance. It began on the day of our text. It became a little more evident on the day when Jesus was crucified and that curtain that covered over the holy of holies where God dwelt was torn in two. It would become even more fully evident about 40 years later when Romans would come in and literally knock stone upon stone over and destroy the temple. You see, that temple could fade away. It had to fade away because a new temple, Jesus, had arisen to take its place. But why should you care about all this? Is this sermon just a lesson about the history of the temple in the Bible? Well, it is that, but not just that. You should care because you should be concerned too with where it is that God dwells with you and where it is that he deals with you. You should want to know where it is that you can find your comfort and your consolation. You need to know where it is that the darkness of your sin can be removed by the light of the Lord's Christ. And blessedly, here is the answer. Unlike in the Old Covenant where one had to sometimes go great distance to arrive at that place where God had chosen to dwell, we now simply get to go wherever Christ himself has promised he is present. We get to worship him in spirit and in truth wherever he has promised to be. And that's good news for us because that means that today 
Right now, you are in such a place. For Christ has promised to be where two or three gather in his name. And so he is here. He has promised to be where his word is proclaimed. And so he is here. He has promised to be where bread and wine are consecrated with his own words and where they are distributed to the people. And so he is here. And so you, you can rejoice. Today, the one who died upon the cross, the one who rose from the grave, he comes to bring you his comfort and his consolation. He comes to assure you that your sins are removed. He comes to assure you that his love for you, it is everlasting. He comes to assure you that you have new life now and that you will have eternal life with him forever. And if you understand that, if you get that Jesus comes here today for you, well, then you are ready. Ready for what? Well, really ready for everything. Ready to live or ready to die. Yes, ready for life or ready for death. For you have seen the Lord's Christ. You have tasted of the salvation which God himself has prepared for you. Your sin-darkened life, it is now lightened with Christ's own holiness. And so you are ready to leave here today and live with purpose, or if the Lord wills, to depart in peace. For the one who dwelt in the temple comes here now to dwell with you and to deal with you. And how does he deal with you? With grace and with mercy and with forgiveness. He comes to give you his life a life that prepares you for this life and the life to come. Jesus is here, which means the glory of the Lord is here, and that all means you are saved. Amen.